The Chevrolet Impala nameplate is certainly an icon in automotive history. The story that began in 1958 saw myriad fits and starts as the nameplate was first discontinued after the 1985 model year, then revived from 1994 to 1996 before being sunset again, and only to be reborn in 2000 and die once again in 2020. Over the 62-year period from 1958 to 2020, Chevrolet sold tens of millions of Impalas, but it all began way back in 1958, with a car that was designed to be Chevrolet's best and was only offered as a two-door hardtop or a convertible. Let's explore the history of the 1958 Chevrolet Impala and how and where 10 generations of Impalas got their start. When it was launched in 1958, the Impala represented an entry from Chevrolet into a price class in which it had never previously participated. Chevrolet had historically been perceived as the value leader, but in the mid-1950s, when the product was planned, the near-luxury or mid-priced segment was experiencing considerable growth, and Chevrolet planners felt it was time to test the waters with an entry that slotted above the $2,500 Bel Air in the lineup. It was, by the way, the same rationale that led Ford product planners to invent the Edsel experiment, but that's another story for a different day. Chevrolet had originally envisioned calling the Impala the Bel Air Executive, but the name was thankfully dropped in favor of the more catchy and light-sounding Impala. The eventual Impala experiment would be tried out on what would become a one-year-only body, For the 1958 Impala shared no sheet metal either with the outgoing 57s or the all-new 59s. And as Chevrolet looked to capitalize on what was then thought to be the expanding mid-price segment, planners felt that Chevrolet should evolve from its historical 115-inch wheelbase cars to something larger and with more presence. Hence, the 1958 Chevrolet and the Impala would be built on a 117.5-inch wheelbase and weighed about 200 pounds more than the outgoing models. And beyond that, virtually everything was new. An all-new chassis with full-coil suspension and an X-frame, all-new sheet metal, and even a new range-topping V8 would be offered in this car. With respect to the sheet metal, the Impala drew cues from two Motorama show cars that came before it, the 1955 Biscayne and the 1956 Corvette Impala. The Biscayne was the more radical show car of the two. Constructed as a four-door hardtop, it sported a toothy grin, bug-eyed headlights, and rounded pontoon fenders up front. A large scallop section dominated the body side, while the rear deck lid had a clean, flat profile that fell gently over either side. One might immediately recognize the roofline on the concept as displaying remarkably similar characteristics to the production Impala, but not much else. The 1956 Corvette Impala, however, is a bit of another story, where the Biscayne roofline now reappeared, albeit in two-door form, and the toothy grill of the Biscayne had now evolved into a wide oval-shaped grill. The Corvette-style grill, however, was ditched for Impala production in favor of a combination bumper and grill, in part due to cost. While the rear of the Corvette Impala didn't sport canted fins like the eventual 58, it does display some fin-like shapes inboard of the typical fin placement at the time. As the 58 Impala began to take its final shape, the design ended up with a different roof line from other Bel Airs and indeed entirely different sheet metal from the windshield back, giving the car its own unique silhouette and terminating with the now famous three taillight cluster at the rear distinguishing the car from other lesser Chevrolets in the lineup. The Impala design also included a faux air scoop in the rear, just above the back window, that some argued was inspired by the Mercedes 300 gull wing. It was, however, not functional. Moreover, the side molding that ran the length of the Impala drew heavily from the 1954 Fiat V8 Coupe that was designed and built by Ghia, An interesting piece of trim, often called the pitchfork, was added to either side ahead of the rear wheel. The overall effect was an exterior that was at once dramatic and different from anything else that Chevrolet had to offer, despite sharing many underhood components and sheet metal from the windshield forward. On the inside, a new interior theme was introduced on the 58 Chevys, 
but the Impalas had some unique touches beyond what was offered in the Bel Airs, including tasteful door panels outfitted with aluminum trim and striped upholstery. Drivers sat behind a two-spoke steering wheel that had been given the Swiss cheese look to infer to drivers that it had been lightweighted due to the sporty nature of the car. Quite a humorous cue, especially given the extended length of the 58 Impalas and weight over the outgoing 1957 models. Under the Impala's sheet metal lay a new X-frame chassis, which replaced the previous perimeter frame. And this new frame was a huge enabler for designers, as it allowed them to lower the overall car by more than several inches without material consequence to interior space. The car was also outfitted with full coil suspension, enabling customers to feel, as Chevrolet said, like they were riding on air. Within the chassis sat some familiar power plants, as well as an all-new 348 cubic inch turbo thrust V8. At the lower end of engine choices was Chevrolet's familiar 235 cubic inch blue flame six-cylinder, making 145 horsepower. One up from the 235 was a 283 cubic inch V8, which came in numerous forms, starting at the low end with a 185 horsepower variant and going all the way up into the near 300 horsepower form, when outfitted with fuel injection. However, the real story was Chevrolet's new 345 cubic inch turbo thrust V8 that made 250 horsepower on the lower end with a four barrel carburetor, and up to 315 horsepower with three two barrel carburetors and in the so-called turbo thrust form. The 348 engine family would later give rise to the famous 409 powerhouse introduced in mid 1961. Transmission choices on the Impala included manuals, Chevrolet's now famous and durable Power Glide transmission, or the extra troublesome Turbo Glide transmission, which was introduced in 1957 and dropped shortly thereafter in 1961. It was about as reliable as the level air suspension option Chevrolet offered, which troubled customers and dealers alike. That system, driven off a compressor under hood, used one rubber bellow at each wheel to help allegedly provide a more stable ride with less brake nose dive and one that could actively adjust to road conditions. Even when it was working, it really didn't do much, and its functional operation was a rare occurrence. However, despite its quirks, the 58 Impala offered customers what they desired. The car sold about 125,000 coupes and 55 convertibles in its inaugural year. Not bad for a time period when the industry was heading into recession and overall car sales were down, with the unemployment rate touching 8%. The success of this particular body was short-lived as GM stylists would soon find themselves penning an all-new 1959 Chevrolet and one that shared considerably more with GM's other divisions than the outgoing 58s, in part due to cost and also due to a desire to rush the models to market once GM stylists had seen the forward-look Chryslers and decided to abort their existing 1959 designs. Hope you enjoyed this feature on the 1958 Impala. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Until next time, check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you.